the way that it works is garbage in equals garbage out. And so much of our food quality comes back to soil quality and how we treat our soils. Mm -hmm. And even though I spend most of my time, you know, talking about industrial environmental contaminants, the bad stuff, soil quality also ties back to good stuff. And what I mean by that is it's one where it's like, not all carrots are created equal. You know, it's mm -hmm. one where if we deplete the soil of the minerals and nutrients, the way that we intentionally, you know, the reason why we whatever eat carrots or apples or, you know, certain types of fresh produce, fruit, vegetables is to get certain types of micronutrients is that if that soil is depleted from all of that good stuff, it's not that just the plants will suck up, suck up the bad stuff. They'll suck up less of the good stuff. And especially for your listeners that are so focused on their health, it's a matter of like, okay, you know, not all carrots are the same. It's one where things like certified organic can have a higher nutritional density just because the soil itself is healthier. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. In this episode, I shared a very fascinating conversation with Jackie Bowen and Oliver Amdrup of The Coming Clean Project about the role of environmental toxins in our health. A little bit of background about Jackie and Oliver. Jackie is the executive director of The Clean Label Project, a nonprofit with the mission to bring transparency to food and product labeling by using analytical chemistry and data investigations to research top selling products. Jackie has a Master of Science in Quality Engineering from Eastern Michigan University, a Master of Public Health in Management and Policy from the University of Michigan, and she's appeared on numerous media outlets, including NBC, ABC, CNN, The Doctors, Dr. Oz, and Dr. Drew. Oliver is co-founder of the natural health and food supplement brand Puri, as well as the founder of the first CrossFit affiliate in Denmark. His interest in food and supplement quality was born out of a desire to ensure his own personal fish oil supplementation was coming from the very best source possible. And since then, he's helped Puri to grow into a company that offers a variety of supplements to address the main nutritional deficiencies of the developed world with full transparency testing across their entire product portfolio. Now, I've known Oliver personally for many years as Puri was one of my sponsors when I competed in the CrossFit Games. He was also on one of my early podcast episodes along with Puri co-founder Julius Heslett. And I continue to be impressed with the standards and the rigor that they hold all of their supplements to. Together through the Coming Clean Project, Jackie and Oliver are working to educate consumers on how environmental toxins can lead to chronic disease and how, as consumers, we can make better food choices. So in this episode, we cover a broad range of topics from the basics of cleaner living to steps you can take to reduce your overall toxin load and even what to look for when purchasing supplements. We also get into some fascinating research, including why vanilla protein powder might be a better choice than chocolate. So sad. Now, before we dive into the episode, I do want to make it clear that this podcast is for general information only and does not provide medical advice. I do recommend that you seek assistance from your personal physician for any health conditions or concerns. So with that, let's get started with the episode. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm really excited to be here with both Oliver and Jackie today to talk all things environmental toxins and the impact that they can have on our health. And this is a new topic here on the Pursuing Health podcast. We haven't really dove into it in detail before. And so I'm really excited about the expertise that both of you will be able to bring. Um, but I thought maybe we could just start with each of you, how you started to develop such an interest in this topic um, and such a strong passion for this area. Yeah. So Oliver, maybe I'll start and then you can jump in. Sounds good. <laughs> so I guess a, a little bit about me. I, I grew up in Michigan, in Northern Michigan, actually. Yay. And so just, <laughs> yes, just appreciating the outdoors mm -hmm. and being able to be fortunate enough to grow up on the you know shores of Lake Michigan. It just fosters such a, um, you know, an interest in the environment when you're out, like, you know, catching snakes and turtles and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so I always <laughs> wanted to go, I always wanted to do something that had, uh, you know, a positive impact on the environment. And then, you know, the crazy webs that we weave over our career path and how you think things are going to go one way. And <laughs> then you end up kind of settling on your chemistry, uh, minor and, uh, all of a sudden it turns into a focus on, uh, kind of toxicology statistics, and all things that are buzzkill at dinner parties. And so, uh, you know, in a, in a long, making a long story short, yeah, it just, it really early on in, in my life, just being able to focus on the environment, recognizing, you know, that what we do, the environment, it's impact on public health. And I've been fortunate enough to kind of 
you know, have a, have a day job that is just part of my personal interest as well. That's amazing. And so interesting too, how it's true. Our paths weave all of these different ways and it doesn't always make sense at the time, but then looking back, you can see how it all connects together. So it's cool to see that happening in your life. How about you, Oliver? And mine started very differently. I would say I was, uh, I was, (laughs) I think growing up in Denmark, you you tend to, yeah, you appreciate the environment. You don't use the outdoor the same way, but you actually think a lot about environment and how to protect it. But it, for me, it started much later. It started when I was uh, uh, when I was actually doing a lot of CrossFit and I was starting to see some inflammation. So I was I was more consumer that wanted to then use a, a supplement at the time. And if it was something that I was going to use kind of on a on an everyday basis, which you know the recommendations for me were because I was struggling a little bit with the omega three omega six fatty acid balances as, as as many people do based on on diets. And I was trying to add something. A lot of people recommended me to add a fish oil. I wanted to know what was in the fish. Oil. And, and that grew into, you know, what's in fish, you know, there's a lot of stuff that are kind of being polluted. And, you know, I couldn't actually, we couldn't, Jules and I, when we were starting the company Puri, we couldn't find that product. So we started to investigate and research and, and, and thought, you know, if, if this is something I'm consuming on a daily basis, and we know this is bad for you, I want to avoid it as much as humanly possible. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. So what just started as being a consumer and wanting to know what was in the supplements that you took, that curiosity led to this whole path in your career where you said, okay, if it's not out there, we're going to figure out how to create it. Um, and, and this is your second time back to the podcast. Actually, I had you and Joel's on previously talking about that journey. So if people haven't heard it, I'd recommend going back to listening to that as well. Yeah, no. So it was like, it's just, it's just a thing where you kind of, the more you actually get to learn and get to understand about it, the, the, the more scary it, it actually seems with the environmental toxins that are kind of building up across us and, you know, whether it's food, air, water, you know, all around us, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when we think about environmental toxins, you know, we might hear this in different places. We hear about BPA or we hear about glyphosate or we hear about, you know, contaminants and supplements or food, but just as a broad overview, how do you think about environmental toxins, the different places where we can get exposed and then which ones we maybe have the greatest toxic burden from? Sure. So when it, when it comes to industrial and environmental contaminants and toxins, basically the, the way I look at it is these are, it's not the brand that a brand is intentionally adding these, right? They're contaminants. So it's not the one where these are ingredients, But the thing is, it's like, I kind of think of them as like opportunistic, you know, piggybackers Uh, that (laughs) is that it's like, if you don't watch out for them, they have the opportunity to end up in a finished product. And the way and where they come from is typically when you think about things like traditional food safety, you hear about things like E. coli, salmonella, listeria, you know, things that contribute to salad, mixed chicken or burrito restaurant recalls, Mm -hmm. you know, things that will contribute to vomiting, diarrhea within 24 to 72 hours. But what we pay attention to at kind of Clean Label Project, my nonprofit that's focused on bringing truth and transparency to consumer product labeling, are more so these industrial environmental contaminants and toxins that contribute to chronic disease, things like cancer, infertility, um, things for your athletes that can contribute to just like inflammation, poor performance. And this can take years, even decades to manifest itself in disease. Um, It really kind of boils down to, you know, if we're talking about heavy metals, plastics, pesticides, those types of things it's pollution. It Mm -hmm. ends up, what happens is that because of our societal choices around mining, fracking, industrial agriculture, these different types of contaminants end up in the air, the water, and the soil. And the plants that end up in our finished product have no choice but to suck this stuff up. And then undoubtedly it gets absorbed into our bodies. And from there, that's where it starts kind of wreaking havoc over time. Wow. (laughs) It's scary to think about just because of how many, um, systems are involved in how many, um, like you said, it's not like it's intentionally being, being done, but it's just the way that, that, um, our world has been developed, that this stuff just started to become part I of the I often think it's very unintentionally. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's often very unintentionally when we've mm-hmm. been kind of buying ingredients and, and raw materials around, like you're actually people that care a lot about, but, but it's just something that you don't test for. Because as mm-hmm. Jackie mentioned, the stuff you test for is the stuff that gets you instant sick. The, mm-hmm. the things that kind of just evolve into you over time that really people have a really hard time grasping is just, it's, it's extremely complicated to, to measure right away. 
Mm-hmm. And I want to also along, along those lines add for your for your listeners is that you know the way that it works is garbage in equals garbage out, and so much of our food quality comes back to soil quality and how we treat our soils. Mm-hmm. And even though I spend most of my time you know talking about industrial environmental contaminants, the bad stuff, soil quality also ties back to good stuff. And what I mean by that is it's one where it's like not all carrots are created equal. You know, it's mm-hmm. one where if we deplete the soil of the minerals and nutrients, the way that we intentionally, you know, the reason why we whatever eat carrots or apples or, you know, certain types of fresh produce, fruit, vegetables is to get certain types of micronutrients is that if that soil is depleted from all of that good stuff, it's not that just the plants will suck up, suck up the bad stuff, they'll suck up less of the good stuff. And especially for your listeners that are so focused on their health, it's a matter of like, okay, you know, not all carrots are the same. It's one where things like certified organic can have a higher nutritional density just because the soil itself is healthier. Wow. And it seems like food is probably one of the biggest places just because we're eating multiple times a day, the biggest places that we're going to get exposed. Can we just focus in on that topic for a little bit and um, how as a consumer, you can start to be more aware of what's in your food from a toxin perspective and how to be more educated and make choices that are going to provide less toxic exposure over time. Sure. Well, the way I look at it is, um, you know, you see all these food claims that'll make, you know, claims on product pack that says (laughs) non-GMO, organic, gluten-free, which is great, but none of them say things like no heavy metals, no E. coli, because it comes down to food safety and food safety is assumed. So it's not really right now. It's, it's an interesting time because um, there's this new, it's called the baby food safety act of 2021. And it's really the um, kind of like FDA food safety first real foray into Mm. looking to regulate heavy metals within food. Now, granted, it's baby food, but it's a start. Um, In the process of going through the different investigation that the House of Representatives did, looking at the harmful effects of heavy metals, which can contribute to long-term, you know, risks like, you know, immune system damage, cancers, those types of things. Um, You know, they identified certain high-risk ingredients. Certain high-risk ingredients for things like heavy metals would include things like rice-based ingredients, also Mm soy-based ingredients. Um, It's also one where if you're looking to control and minimize your exposure to pesticides, after testing thousands, if not tens of thousands of food and consumer products, I can t- definitely tell you that, you know, the organic promise of less exposure to pesticides holds true. And mm-hmm. then of course, when we're talking about things like plastic, you know, it's a matter of, you know, it's a matter of kind of consumers where possible, steering clear from any of those plastic containers, sticking to glass where possible, watching those carry out containers, don't nuke sty- styrofoam, things like that, that can help minimize that exposure. But it's one where, When it comes to kind of the whole, I guess, like a food safety regulatory policy, when it Mm -hmm. comes to this type of stuff, food safety and looking at it in the long term, it's still quite in its infancy. Oliver, what are your, um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts? How do you guys go about minimizing? um, I think one thing that's ingredients. Yeah, I think one thing is, is really, I'll come back to the ingredients in a second, but one thing is really interesting on like, yes, organic holds true on uh, on pesticides and the less use of that, but for environmental types such as heavy metals, you know, there's, there's not necessarily any correlation between the organic products or not. And again, it's not something that is tested for, which is kind of insane when you look at how many people who are actually exposed to uh, heavy metals uh, around the world. It should be something that, uh, that you're testing for. And especially when you do these blind tests that Jackie has been doing with the Clean Label Project of going out and kind of seeing what's, what's in the products and always, as you saw in the baby food scandals, you know, you find a large amount of really bad for your heavy metals in, you know, the most popular the foods so like i think the key is first to getting like some kind of standards up and running and then getting a testing procedure um so jackie back to to your question Mm -hmm. a little bit it's probably more like like the things that we've we've been doing and encountering is that you know one thing is you know buying organic uh, ingredients when you can't get organic and when organic makes more sense because sometimes wild products actually make more sense maybe than organic and, and so on. So you got to remember that we started out with fish oil. And if you look at organic fish oil versus vi- wild fish oil, it's actually very, you know, it's very interesting. Organic fish oil might be fed with something in a tank, so on that's organic, but you know, the quality of it is not nearly as good as the wild. So, you know, that, that, that can be various things. That's why at the end of the day, the key thing is to test the finished product 
because all of these different certification that just kind of, you know, they test the percentage of what's out there or they do like these like few analysis drip out here. I think the key and why Jackie and I have spoken so much together and spent so many hours together is that like the idea behind is like a second like a second layer of testing and like a, an, an all in transparency pledge on the finished products in what we would say is the most dangerous food groups or the food groups that are at least at the highest risk of uh, exposure. You know, it's not that like testing. These things are not that expensive, you know, doing like a lab test for a few thousand dollars when a brand is making uh, millions and millions and millions on, on the same type of skew. It's just, it's not that expensive figuring out how to make it all clean. That's where it's get expensive. But we had actually a really interesting talk the other day with with uh, Richard Fuller from the Pure Earth, uh, from Pure Earth, and you know he, what they've been doing in order to just with simple, small, uh, you know, fairly cheap uh, actions, they've been able to really like minimize the amount of lead, for example, in food chains in in Asia and so on, which has an insane impact on on the health and well being uh, of us and the future. So. Yeah, sorry. We can go down a tangent uh, here, no. I feel like, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting. We got to get the awareness, obviously, but we also got to get some solutions in. Um, yes, that's amazing. And I have so many questions. I think, um, one, it is reassuring to know that, you know, when things are organic, they are lower in pesticides. So that, that I think, as a consumer, is somewhat reassuring to know that label means something. But to your, I like your point, Oliver, that, you know, all that's testing for is pesticides. And there's other things like heavy metals that could also be problematic and how we need to evolve, you know, our testing and our processes and regulations, um, the more that we learn. And I also thought the point you made about um, wild versus organic was important too, because depending on the food they are eating or the product, you know, even outside of foods, there's different things to look for. And so I think as a consumer, mm -hmm. it can be really confusing to know, you know, basically as a consumer, you just want to know, is this going to be healthy for me or is this not healthy for me? But there's so many different labels and so many different um, ways that companies will, will put things forward that can be extremely confusing. So um, maybe this would be a good time, just Jackie, for you to talk a little bit about at the Clean Label Project, how, what that testing process is like um, and how you're trying to help um, make it a little bit more transparent for consumers. Sure. So at Clean Label Project, so we're a national nonprofit with the mission to bring truth and transparency to consumer product labeling. So let's be honest, marketing departments can do a really effective job at selling comfort and security. I mean, go into any nutritional store, find me one supplement or one protein powder that on the package doesn't say this product is full of nothing but wholesome goodness. It tastes, you know, and you know, they all say that. And so if that's the case, where's, where's the bad stuff? Find me one product that says, you know, eh, this product doesn't taste very good. This is going to make frankly, you sick. <laughs> yeah. This is going to make you sick. And frankly, it doesn't even work. Um, right. You know, so it's like, if everything says it's great, then how do you actually know what's not? And that's right. where Clean Label Project comes in. It, in analytical chemistry and data, we trust. Um, what we look to do is different types of consumer investigations into top selling, um, into top, top selling products. We cover a range of products, ranging from baby food to pet food investigations, as well as protein powder, supplements, things like that. And then what we look to do is, um, you know, bring this information to light with consumers in the form of white papers, or sometimes depending on the impact and what our findings show as part of doing this testing, um, we actually go through the full peer review academic publication of of these of the studies of what we find. Um, the way we go about doing our investigations is first and foremost, we look to simulate the consumer shopping experience. Like literally I go to the grocery store, mm. I buy the stuff off the grocery store shelf, just like any consumer would. The only difference is I take them to an analytical chemistry lab in order to get tested. And from there, it's one where if you've got all of these choices of whether it's a multivitamin, a vitamin C, a, a fish oil, if if you've got all of these choices, then from a consumer perspective, it's like, okay, if you're looking for the biggest ROI, that biggest return on your investment in terms mm -hmm. of the most amount of omega that has the least amount of contaminants that is at a great price, um, what we look to do is bring that information to light with consumers through our investigations. We That's also amazing. offer... A, um, we also do work with brands in terms of having a certification program, just like we do with Oliver and Puri, where we will randomly test their products to make sure they stay true to their quality, to their word and their quality promise. And even in the case of Puri, we actually go and they're part of our transparency project. 
where these guys are down with us just taking all their test results and posting them <laughs> posting them publicly <laughs> on our website. So clearly they are they are pretty hardcore when it comes to their commitment to transparency and ingredient quality. You're testing everything yeah. and it's I know uh, we look at their nutritional density and yeah. we look at all of their stuff. Yeah. So they're they're great because they're really committed. It's one where it's like, no, the good, the bad, the ugly, just post it all up there. Like, okay, for the world to see. And, yeah. Right. And that's what we hope, sorry, Julie, but that's what we hope the future yeah. will be, right? Like that we, we actually have that data on, on, on all brands. So you would mm-hmm. like, if you had knowledge that, okay, I've been exposed to, let's say more uh, lead in, in mind and it's in my body. I would try to avoid the product that has the highest uh, amount of lead in it. If, if there were some kind of difference, it's kind of like buying a car, you would have, you would have some data points that you can actually you can compare different cars to each other and still make make sense of it and that's i think the goal uh, for this project too which is uh, to eventually have that set of data on the stuff that you really do not want in your product to be able to make educated uh, decisions right mm-hmm. yeah it's amazing and i think that's one of the things that i had always been so impressed with about puri is how you all that is your first priority is making sure that you have the best quality products and you're not afraid to be transparent about it and not afraid to make big changes if you find out that something isn't as pure as you thought it was. And I think one example of this that I I think is educational just for the listeners in general is about protein powders. Because I remember when you started making, wanted to make a, a vegan protein powder um, and I liked it cause I wasn't really able to do whey cause I was having you know, a little bit more sensitive to whey. Um, but then you tested it and said, wow, it's really hard to find vegan sources of protein that don't have heavy metal contaminants. So can you just talk a little bit about that process? I, yes. I can. And it's, I, and Jackie, you can as well, I'm sure. But the, like <laughs> the, 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 the thing for us as a brand was the consistency in actually sourcing the ingredients was so freaking hot. And with, with <laughs> vegan products, that is, uh, uh, you know, really, really hot. And we've set ourselves some standards internally, which have often, you know, uh, right now we have an internal kind of standard issue, so to speak, where our standards are 300 times better than the standards that are set by the regulations. And we're like, you know, is, is this something, you know, we're not selling that product if, if we have that issue uh, with our standards, but the issue is all the others are. So as a consumer, uh, sorry, as a as a buyer who's buying ingredients, you know when you have these standards, it's uh, it's it's really freaking hard. And vegan vegan uh, proteins in general, and Jack, and you can speak more to that. You know they they when you concentrate the protein content, you also concentrate whatever was in the ground. Uh, you know where they were sourced from, and and that we felt has been so hard for us to do like repeatedly. We we actually found a source now that we think and like that we know for the data we've seen. We can't say about the future. That's the other thing here is like, we might end up stopping, uh, you know, making a products again in the future because it, we can't get the raw ingredients and the inequality that we have, which is terrible for consumers. We had so many angry consumers that liked the product and then we discontinued based on that. But, but you know, that's, that's, that's the pledge of Puri, right? Basically that, that it, we promise it's, it's clean or at least, uh, you know, that the world is polluted in some shape or form. That's why there will be trace uh, uh, of, of pollution in pretty much everything uh, you, you do and touch that comes from the world. So we can't be like, you know, saints. That's not possible yet, right? <laughs> but, but again, from the standards that we've set, that um, makes it so hard to actually create so Jackie, mm-hmm. you can you can talk much more about that because you've tested yeah. so many different proteins. In terms of protein powder, so it's been a few years, but what we what we did is we went into the marketplace, we purchased 121 of the best-selling protein powders in America using the amazon.com bestsellers list. Again, tested them for heavy metals, pesticides, plastics. Um, and you know, some of the things that were interesting that were kickers, you know, going back to the whole plant-based versus whey, um, it was, it was interesting because I, I didn't really know what to expect. The, the impetus for doing the testing is like after the new year's feeling gross, looking to set that new year's resolution. And mm-hmm. so many people reach for protein powder of athletes of all capabilities, looking to supplement their already healthy diet by using a, you know, a, you know, a scoop full of protein powder in their morning smoothies, those types of things. Um, so when we tested the top selling protein powders, there's a few things that absolutely rang true. The first is that by far the cleanest protein source where it was whey based protein. I will say that egg tested by far the best, but there are only a handful of egg based protein mm-hmm. powders on the market by far on average, the most contaminated were your plant-based protein powders, but I'll elaborate on that. 
within those, those listeners that are following a vegan diet that aren't going to reach for whey, it's totally fine. Within the plant-based space, on average, we found that the cleanest vegetarian protein source happened to be pea protein. Where we saw the most contamination was going to be your soy or your hemp. Hemp is a natural bioaccumulator. What that means is hemp is just a really good garbage collector. Mm-hmm. It's just inherently good at sucking up the bad stuff in the ground. And Jackie, and here- I love hemp seeds. That's, that's <laughs> the line, right? like, yeah. And there's no testing on the one that I'm buying. So oh, like, no. I got to do it very rarely. Oh, yeah. yeah, you're going to have to sparingly. Yes, it's all about it's all about making sure you've got diversity in diet. But even military installations in the US will plant hemp in order to suck up any of this like residual artillery, you know, contamination that happens to be in the ground. And so it's just hemp just happens to be really good at it. Um, and so in for whey based proteins, it's one where I guess, I, you know, I try to think about the, what the root cause of this stuff could be. And just like we talked about before, you know, the fortunate and unfortunate thing is that we've got kidneys and livers and the whole purpose of those things is to help remove these different types of contaminants from the body. And likewise, you know, because of whey based protein, we'll also have that additional filter, if you will, unlike plant, ba- plant based proteins, which again, they have no choice, these plants, but to suck up what's in the ground. So again, garbage in equals garbage out comes back to soil quality. Another thing that was interesting in terms of testing the top selling um, protein powders, of which Puri tested amazing, that was your whey vanilla, correct? Bourbon yeah. vanilla. Yeah. Um, and uh, by far, we saw that the cleanest flavor was vanilla. The most mm. contaminated flavor was chocolate. And I'll elaborate what a on bummer. that. bummer. I know, and right? That is and, a, I'll elaborate on that too. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is with chocolate, it's actually really interesting. This amazing organization called As You So did an investigation into chocolate, um, just confectionery chocolate. So think of all of your big chocolate companies that, you know, you enjoy mm-hmm. around, you know, the holidays and, um, you know, Halloween, Valentine's Day and all of those big chocolate companies. What they found is that chocolate was testing really high for cadmium. So cadmium is another heavy metal linked to long-term um, kind of like chronic disease, including cancer, um, and found out that you know chocolate, just for whatever reason, just pulled a lot of cadmium out of the soil. Um, so what we saw is that vanilla doesn't have that same problem. So that's where we yeah. see is that vanilla, whey based happened to be among it happened to be in general on average the cleanest whereas mm-hmm. those chocolate sources um unless those brands do a lot of scrutiny on that chocolate source and making sure to have lower levels of cadmium chocolate is just inherently really good at sucking that stuff up that's so interesting and i would imagine then so it's probably from the cacao so probably dark chocolate has even more cadmium when you're thinking that dark chocolate, you're eating something healthier. Is that true? You're, you're probably right. Yes. And I'll, I would be happy to send you over a link to the, as you so investigation, because it was I based would love on, to see that yeah, yeah, that would be too, right Jackie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's because the thing is with theirs, it's one where like, don't get me wrong. I mean, chocolate also has like amazing benefits around yeah. antioxidants mm-hmm. and it's really nice to have like a reason to indulge and stuff like that. But it's also one where it's interesting, especially for people who are consuming protein powder, multiple multiple serving several times a day, um, you know, just mm. kind of keep this stuff in mind, you know, cause it's a matter of that cumulative effect on your body. It's not just mm. these heavy metals aren't just going to come from your protein powder. It's inherently present in the environment and every meal that we eat. And it's one where, you know, until we kind of, you know, really start looking at our dollars for a vote in the food systems that we, we believe in. And we recognize that our environmental policy also in, impacts our public health. Um, you know, this is kind of the unfortunate bed we have to sleep in, but we, there are things you can do to minimize your exposure for sure. Wow. So protein powders probably look for a way at be, be cognizant of flavor. Um, and you have now published uh, results from that study, correct? So that people can go and see how each brand stacked up. Yeah. Check out the cleanlabelproject.org website and for more information. Yeah, you can definitely do that. But in general, I'll just say if you can get a, uh, a lab report that shows environmental toxin in the actual batch of what you're seeing, you know, mm-hmm. different places do it. There's other organizations as well that test for it, but just make sure you can actually, if you can get that, then you can, tr- you can, you can consume and trust, uh, you know, whether it's the, the, the plant based protein or, or the, the cacao that, that you're having, because, you know, one of the things we did, we've been through probably, I would say, 
Uh, my team would know better the details, but between five and 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 ten different cacao, organic cacao uh, beans uh, from from different areas to kind of figure out which one is the cleanest, so we can keep a fairly high amount of cacao in the product because we actually like that and we wanted to, like, we thought it was a really nice part of the, the that protein flavor. Um, but but we actually had to in the end just decrease the amount of cacao we're using in the product, so a little less flavor. If we want again with the mindset of this is a product you might consume day out, day in, and again and again. Mm-hmm. You know we want to make sure that we are on our low standards, which is uh, often Proposition sixty five, which I'm sure we'll come back to, or even even lower, depending on uh, yeah where where in the world we are and what what we kind of seeing as the the strictest standards basically. And that's a great point that Jack alluded to earlier too, is just looking at the frequency that you're eating these foods and having diversity in your diet and, and all the different things that you're eating and taking that into consideration too. There's a certain amount of sort of risk tolerance that you can have, um, but just being aware, I think is the most important part. Mm-hmm. And there's different foods that are more contaminated than others. So just be aware mm-hmm. of those. Uh, you know, what's the list called in US, uh, Jackie? We, the is that dirty... the environmental working groups? Yeah, the... Clean 15 and dirty dozen. The exactly. Dirty Something like that. Just be aware of those. So just when you know you make those, if you buy the same kind of, let's say, rice and eat it over and over again, you know, that that might be a chance of buildup of arsenic. So like, mm-hmm. just make sure that you, yeah, variation and and, and look for those. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to touch on supplements too, because that's obviously another big area um, for our audience that, you know, people may be using supplements for their health or their performance. And it's always a question that I get about how do you figure out which supplements are good quality and not every supplement company is, I would say most are not as transparent as Fiori is about um, all their ingredients and, and their quality standards. So for the consumer, what are things that they should be looking for or be aware of that might be in their supplements and what are things that they should be looking for on the supplement bottle or packaging um, to know that they're getting a, a supplement that's more pure quality. That's a that's, it's a, that's, a, that's a tough question. It's a big question. There's a lot of angles to it, but uh, that's that's one thing that we you know one thing is choosing you know the the most important supplements, the ones that really give you a bang for the buck, like D vitamin or omega three fatty acids or magnesium, the things that we know based on macro data that we are actually missing in our diets. Those mm-hmm. are in general the ones with that has the most heavy evidence behind them, and so on. Those are the ones that I would uh, you know look into first. If you can get a little deeper on your own. Like, how's your diet? What are you, how's your living? Can you get some testing done on yourself kind of to know your own deficiencies and optimization and what's your goal? Are you like competing? You need certain different, uh, you know, you probably need more of some stuff and, and less of others and so on. So just have, have that in mind. When you then start looking at the brands, there's two things uh, that you want to, you know, make sure you include. So one thing I, 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 I we used this example actually in CrossFit back in the days uh, as well. It's like, do you want to be on time or do you want to be at the right place? <laughs> right? You need both. You can't, if you're, you're meeting someone, you got to be both at the right place and on time. The same goes for supplements. Do you want it to be clean and efficient? So you can have a really clean product that has almost no active ingredients. You know, that doesn't make any sense anyway, because you're consuming, let's say, omega fish oil, you're consuming it to get EPA, DHA, like the omega-3 fatty acids. So you can have a, a super clean product that had almost zero EPA, DHA in it. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. So you, you need to have a, an effect, obviously, that will deliver you results, especially when this is a product that has zero instant gratification. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's not something you're enjoying. Like at least a protein shake you can be enjo- enjoying, but like <laughs> capsules and pills uh, for that matter, you know, it got to deliver. And then at the same time, it got to be clean. Those are the two things. I would look for, you know, the third-party testing and I would look for them that are obviously doing it on a batch level. And I'm, I don't think a lot of people is doing that yet. Uh, I think a lot of manufacturers are testing their raw ingredients, but, you know, let's get more p- people to touch the actual product that is out on the shelf that's being consumed. Uh, because also some of the studies that you've shown, Jackie, and seen, you know, sometimes we, we, you saw, for example, I think I wasn't in protein category, in the baby food category, I can't remember, but it was like more than half of the brands that claimed they were BPA free had BPAs in it. Yeah. So here's what I think is, is like, it's because they think they're buying ingredients that are BPA free. It's not because mm-hmm. they're intentionally uh, know that they have BPA in it. We're just going to put this on the label. It's just that that's at least how I think the industry uh, is, is working. So just, you know, 
if you can get that level of transparency, you know, especially something you consume on a daily basis, that's where I would, uh, yeah, spend my dollars. Yeah, I completely, Otherwise, I yeah. completely agree. And maybe elaborating a little bit on BPA, you're absolutely right. And it was actually in the protein powder category. So it's like, so often you see BPA free, whether it's on your, you know, bottled water or your like your beverage container, whatever it happens to be. The thing that's fascinating is it's like, if BPA doesn't just come from finished product manufacturing, BPA is actually, um, and for, for those in your audience, that may not be familiar. That's called bisphenol a, um, basically it's, it's, it's a, it's a plasticizer. It's actually allowed as a food con a food contact surface or, or additive. So you see it in a variety of things in a food manufacturing environment. So when you see brands make a BPA free claim. It's also, it's one where it's a question of like, is that in the finished product? Have you asked any questions of your supply chain to see, do they mm -hmm. use BPA in any of their liners, any of their trays and making the product? Um, you know, when you say BPA free down to what level based on what standard it comes down to like, how do you actually interpret the, the claim free from, mm -hmm. um, and then going back to what Oliver said in terms of when it comes to selecting supplements, the other thing that I would say too, and Oliver, you and I bonded over our vitamin D deficiency. Um, yeah. Another thing too is like, Very make sure interesting, to, right? it's, it's a really interesting story. Yeah. We, yeah. um, you know, the thing is also make sure to get tested because sometimes supplements can be too much of a good thing. You know, it's a matter of like, does your, does your body need it? Um, so it was one where it's interesting. I was one of clean label projects, technical advisors is an, an MD. And she was telling me about, you know, growing up in, in Michigan, just inherently um, people from, you know, Northern climates and uh, higher elevations happen to have um, uh like lower levels of vitamin D, which has been linked to things like infertility, colon cancer, things like that. And so she's like, next time she's like, I, I anticipate this to be this next huge big trend because so many people were now applying sunscreen, typically get your vitamin D from the sun. So many of us are indoors working at the office. Um, people aren't getting their, their sunshine, their natural vitamin mm -hmm. D. So I'm like, Oh, you know, next time I went to the doctor, I made note, let's make sure to get, you know, vitamin D tested, mm -hmm. got it tested. And it came back and I was 23 and where you want to oh. be is any, something over 30, um, mm -hmm. ideally over 50, but at least over 30. So it's technically deficient. I was put on a high concentration vitamin D told the story to Oliver when I happened to see him. And he's like, no kidding. He's like, I got tested for vitamin D and poor Oliver up in the Nordic area. You're, you were like seven. You were, yeah, I was horrible. like, I, exactly. I was, I was wow. like, Oh, you need it now. You need it bad. That was before uh, you started Puri, yeah. hopefully. That was before uh, okay. I started Puri. But I actually <laughs> interestingly also found out that I had a hard time absorbing it. So uh, ah. later on, because they started me on a pretty high dose, so I did a really high dose and it didn't really increase uh, until uh, Umaro, a friend of us uh, mm -hmm. that you also know, Julie, you know, he put me on the most insane doses, right? To, to make sure we finally got up there and we did some DNA testing on me as well. And so I had a really hard time mm -hmm. uh, basically absorbing D vitamin. So I and there can be other dose. factors too. Like I learned, you know, magnesium, if you're deficient in magnesium, sometimes that can affect vitamin D absorption too. So it's all of these other nutrients yeah. that interact together. Um, okay. So uh, Jackie, can you talk to any of the other, obviously, you know, people can look for clean label projects results, but any, you know, any of the other um, certifications that they may see on supplement bottles um, and sort of what those mean or what they should be looking out for. Definitely. So I, before coming to Clean Air Project for 15 years, I'd be remiss to not mention I worked at um, NSF International, which is a World Health Organization collaborating center on food safety, water quality. They've got a pretty amazing, robust dietary supplement program focused on both GMP as well as banned substances, where especially for some of them, your more elite athletes, that's going to be a really big deal. Um, and so obviously that's another great resource. Clean Label Project, you will see that on a variety of supplements. The work that we do focused on industrial environmental contaminants and toxins. Um, you can also see that whole transparency project using QR codes. So you can actually pop the hood, kick the tires, see how products actually performed. Um, other references you may see on product packaging will be things like, you know, USP or making references to CGMP. That would be good manufacturing practices. Good manufacturing practices is kind of the baseline when it comes to FDA compliance, the minimum expectation within a food safety manufacturing environment. So these are a variety of the different things you can see um, that you'll see of claims on pack. But in general, if there's a certain supplement or any food product that you love, that you're enjoying every day um, or that your family is, is consuming, 
you know, it's a great time to be a consumer. Use social media to ask questions, demand answers, and use, you know, the thing is with social media, then you hold them publicly accountable to answer. Um, so I would say, ask those questions in those types of forums. You're so tough, Jackie. And, uh, but I know, I think it's actually, be be the annoying consumer sometimes. Totally. That's, that's how we started as well. And we were asking these questions to the brands like, hey, can we get a report on how much mercury is in your fish oil? And the rare thing is that you rarely couldn't get anything out of it. So it's obviously, you know, it's it's getting much better. Uh, we're seeing much more attention on this. But, but you know, ask the questions. I would say also, if you have a favorite product, maybe ask them to get it tested. Uh, mm -hmm. that you consume on a daily basis. I would love to have so many more products tested back to that dark chocolate that I love here. Mm -hmm. It's not tested. I'm going to send it to you, Jackie, at some point to, uh, to run it through the lab. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I understand. Yes. <laughs> it's my, that's, a, yeah. that's a great idea. Okay. So, so knowing that, you know, GMP is something that you may see on labels, but that's sort of the bare minimum. That's, I think, good for people to know. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the greatest quality. Um, and then some of these other um, certifications like, NSF or, you know, your clean label project, or you said one other, the transparency, something about transparency. Yep. The clean, that would be the clean label project transparency project. And that would be project, the one okay. just like, yeah, that Pure is using where it's like the QR code that allows you, you to actually yeah. see. That's one thing to have yeah. like, okay, That's you've got scare. a third party That's seal. <laughs> it's another thing where it's like, okay, it's got Here's a third party seal yeah. and it, you know, we've got nothing to hide. Here's all the deets. Yep. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I know. And it's, it, it be, if you're a manufacturer out there, be aware that it will take some time to get to that point where you get it mm -hmm. up because it's just, we've had to fiddle with so many small details when you, when you do on um, every single batch of every single product, you put a, a, a QR code that take you directly to the test results of, of that actual product. It's uh it's something that will take some time. One day, I hope this is actually government regulated and it's the way it's driven. So it's just mm -hmm. easier to kind of, to, you you fall into a category. You know, we can't promise we'll always be the cleanest, but we can promise that we always uphold the standards that we have set intentionally. Because again, I think so many brands are doing it unintentionally. So if mm -hmm. we at least can uphold some standards that we've set intentionally, that's, you know, that's the key. That's great. One other question about purchasing. So a lot of people now will purchase supplements on Amazon. And I have wondered or thought about, is there a difference between buying it direct from the source versus buying on Amazon? You hear like, you know, crazy things about maybe things getting changed around, or even just thinking about these supplements being stored in warehouses for a long time and the impact of temperature, other environmental conditions. Have you ever done any testing on, you know, like a supplement that's sold through Amazon versus from directly from the manufacturer? That's would be a great test. I haven't, but I will say this. I did see that Amazon is looking to kind of improve how they go about the kind of like their quality assurance in terms of supplements. You know, I'm not exactly sure the extent to which that can be regulated. Um, in general, when in doubt, if you want to get the good stuff, make sure just go direct to the brands. You know, the other thing to kind of keep in mind for some of these like, you know, small to mid-sized companies is that, you know, Amazon is an amazing platform and able to, able to get your product out there in front of everyone. But after you know that you kind of, you know, that it's something that you're going to use, you know, sometimes signing up for those direct to consumer um, where you can get better deals and things like that, it, sometimes buying it from directly from the brands can be a, a great way to ensure the quality, making sure that it's got the shelf life. That's something that you can trust as well as it's one where, you know, you developing more of this relationship, coupon codes and things with brands. You have easier access at least, and it's easier to communicate. That's what I think is the hardest through Amazon as a consumer, right? Like you don't really get a lot of, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one communication. Uh, so, so that's different. I, I still think Amazon can do a good job and they actually do it. That they're, they're starting to, as Jackie mentioned, they've, they've, they've initiated a new set of rules to kind of be stricter on the qualities that they put in. Um, but yeah, you know, if you want more information, you can there's go just, straight to the brand. It's easier. Right. right? Yeah. There's just so many layers these days. There's so many you layers. Have to, right. that you have to think about. But I think it's a great point. You know, once it's something you know you're going to take on a regular basis for the long term, it's also just a great way to, to better support that company and that brand just to go directly to them. And a lot of them have, you know, like the monthly memberships or things that you can get regular shipments that makes it easier to achieve. So that's a great point. Um, okay. So I just, I know we don't have too much time here left, but I just wanted to ask the question because we spoke, spent a lot of time focusing on food suppl and supplements in particular, but, um, and I think we've given people some great information and tips on how to be more informed consumers there. But if we think about other places that people might be 
getting exposed to toxins just in their daily life and environment, what do you think are sort of the biggest things people can do, like biggest bang for your buck in order to decrease their total um, toxic load? I would say another one in addition to food would be your different consumer products. So specifically, especially, um, you know, looking at personal care products and cosmetics, your skin is your biggest organ. And so, so often it's one where I think there was a statistic I heard that most women on average apply 23 chemicals before they leave the house in the morning. You know, when you think of cosmetics and body wash and shampoo and conditioner, um, lotions and all of those types of things, um, it's a matter of also looking at that these different types of chemicals come through those sources as well. So be mindful of it. Your household cleaning materials, think about, think about the things that you spray within your, within your home, also contributing to kind of that indoor air pollution, right? And mm-hmm. so it's a matter of where possible, you know, trying to minimize your, your chemical load in those capacities. And are there places that people can go or things to look for when they're buying those types of products um, to know what they're getting? Absolutely. Again, you know, in terms of clean air project, we've done some work within consumer products as well as household cleaning products, but there's a lot of other amazing organizations out there really promoting more of those environmentally forward environmental Mm -hmm. working group. Consumer reports have also Mm -hmm. done different types of investigations into what's actually in this stuff. For sure. And for cleaning products too, one thing I've noticed, you know, there's a lot of um, brands out there that are making cleaning products that are clean, but I, oftentimes there are things that you can make yourself that are really easy. We're just so so used to having to buy everything in a bottle, but you know, a couple of ingredients, you can make great household cleaners and for much, much cheaper too. You're absolutely correct. It's a matter of first making sure that you get kind of like the the container, the spray container that you're going to use so that you can apply it. It's always interesting that with, uh, you know, on the topic of household cleaners, I remember, it's, it's been a while now. It's probably been like 10 years ago. It's, it's interesting because it's just like supplements is that you first, in order to get a repeat purchase for a brand, to get a repeat purchase from a customer, it has to fulfill its function first. So if you're going to have a household cleaning product and it's going to be environmentally responsible and sustainable, the first thing it needs to do is work. And then it needs to have that characteristic, just like a supplement of like, first thing I need is for you to make sure that it actually, I get the protein, which is the whole reason why I buy it. And second, make sure it has all these other amazing characteristics. And so along those lines, it's one where in the, you know, kind of environmentally forward uh, household cleaning product category, it's one where early on, there are some challenges in terms of efficacy, but I mean, lately it's been one where whether you choose to make it at home or whether you choose to kind of buy some more of those environmentally forward ones at the end of the day, they're much more effective than they were back in the day. Another thing to add to you, Julie, there is uh, one of the things that we've, especially in the U.S., is probably uh, lead and paint. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. not something that you might be uh, aware of, but in, in Europe, that's illegal. And, 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 you know, there's a damn good reason for it as well. But, but I think it, it is not necessarily, is it legal now in, in, in U.S., Jay? No, the un, I think the, the problem is it's, it's, un, it's unleaded paint, but because so many homes are older, that leaded it, paint is still in mm-hmm. these homes. Mm-hmm. And, that's, and that goes back to like the old appliances in general, just uh, is there lead in pipes in your house? Mm-hmm. Uh, because that can, can sneak in and, and wreak havoc on you. So, uh, you know, some of those things are also worth to consider. I think the story we had, Jackie, uh, from, from Stephanie Canal, uh, from the turf, that the, mm-hmm. her kids' mm-hmm. school. Uh, I heard and again, that one. That's- exactly where they and, and kids are putting everything into their mouth and babies. And so, and, and they're even more fragile when it comes to these uh, uh, heavy metals. So, you know, mm-hmm. that's something to be aware of. Um, I actually had, a, you know, kind of like a, it's a simple thing at home, but, you know, we, we, when we bought our, our first house, an old house here in, in, in Denmark, you know, we have this little pest called uh, silverfish, which is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's basically, it's not very annoying. It's, I think it, it's just, it, it doesn't do anything dangerous, but it's, it's, it's annoying. It's a little one. It, it eats books that, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a bug them. or is it a fish? It's, it's a buck, but it's called silver fish, it's right? Called a fish. So, um, um, but it, it, just, it doesn't move survive. like a fish and it's silverish. But, but I'm thinking of that, normally you would put out like, uh, you know, most people uh, just yeah. use different kind of insecticides in your home mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. that you would like, because, you know, there's definitely ways you can kill them naturally. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not always super efficient with garlic gloves around, mm-hmm. like around the house or whatever you can put out. But, you know, so, so you're, no, without actually knowing it, I was using some of these products before and I thought, 
what am I doing when I was like, I'm actually putting out uh, insecticides in, in my own house and I have small yeah. kids, right? That uh, are crawling around. So something like that, that you don't really think of, it's something you've always done, so to speak, at least in, 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 in the upbringing mm-hmm. that we've had and they should be safe. And we know Europe is, is kind of strict, especially Denmark on, on these type of products, but still I wouldn't spray stuff around my, my bedroom uh, to kill silver fish. And, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's small such a great like point. It made me think about, you know, here in the U S you know, if you buy a new house, you're going to get people coming to knock on the door every few days, knowing that you're a new homeowner and they're going to want to spray and help you, you know, one to, for lawn mm-hmm. care, they're going to want to, they're going to want to make sure there's all kinds of companies that will come and try to spray to prevent you from getting bugs and spiders and um, insects that take hold in the house. And so you know, and they market it in such a way that it's supposed to be environmentally friendly or like they do this in daycare. So it's safe, but you just have to think about what you're spraying and your kids playing in the lawn or your kids playing in the house and what impact that that could have. Um, It's designed to kill, right? Like it is. Yeah. So, and it's damn efficient. (laughs) And it's, and it's annoying, right? You're like, well, I don't really want bugs all over my house. I don't want to have to deal with termites or something that that are like chewing through my house. So it's hard to make that decision. Um, I think a lot of times you just don't want to deal with it, but then thinking about the impact that it can have over time um, is just something we should all be aware of. Um, Okay. And then I think the other, so just kind of recapping here, some things that we talked about one making sure that we try to get food from good sources that, you know, organic is helpful, but there's other kinds of foods that may have other toxins like heavy metals that are not necessarily tested for eating organic, ideally eating local, knowing where your food is coming from, getting a variety of foods being really important. We talked about um, the protein sources, especially, and some of the problems with vegan protein, but pea probably being the one that has the least amount of heavy metals. We talked about some of the flavorings and chocolate. I'm going to have to go get my chocolate check night, my dark chocolate check now too, because that's what I love to eat every day. Um, and then we talked about supplements and how to be, um, just an educated consumer in terms of buying supplements that one are going to have the positive health impact you want, but to not bring a lot of extra contaminants that can have a negative effect. Um, and then just some environmental things too. And I also liked the point that Jackie brought up earlier about just being aware of containers, right? Like plastic containers, um, what you're microwaving your food in, those little things that um, are easy to pay attention to um, and can make a big difference. And Jackie, just to clarify too, um, is there a big difference if you're talking about purchasing food that's coming in a plastic container just because it's being stored there um, or just in general using plastic containers for things like drinks or microwaving your food in those in general try to steer clear from plastic and you're starting to see much more of like a transition over Mm -hmm. to paper as well as glass because of this Mm -hmm. concern around plastic but in general where plastic becomes an issue is when you have that you know increased temperature where it starts to break down so just like how sometimes you hear of like don't leave your water bottles in your car overnight especially when it's hot outside yeah you know but the thing is Until it shows up at the grocery store, you don't know what necessarily has happened to that container Mm -hmm. and how it was treated. Now, the other thing I will say is there's a lot of brands out there that have plastic containers because let's let's be honest, it's convenient because you don't want your products to break. It's a matter of the brands also doing their diligence and doing that testing that it's not, you know, there's there's different types of testing. It's called shelf stability testing that they'll see how long when they when you see those expiration dates because the test was was conducted to see how long it'll have the um, not turn rancid, it'll still have the potency, but along those same lines, brands also know if their packaging starts to break down. Um, Mm -hmm. So along those lines, it's a matter of just like Oliver, I think you guys also do plastics testing and things like that too. We do. And I think it's a really, like it's it's a whole new podcast pretty much, right? Because it's really complicated. (laughs) Uh, We've been trying to to transition into different things. And I guess because the consumer might think, okay, glass is much better, but it's also heavier. And if it's not recycled the right way, it kind of, can be worse you know there can be several things you know then you want to do biodegradable for supplements but ah that impacts the stabilization or the the shelf life or you know how fast it goes rancid so we've 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 plates as long as you can actually keep it in the cycle and in you again test the end products at the end to see there's no bad stuff in it uh, you know then you have uh, uh, i think then plastic and recyclable plastic can be a good substitute uh, or a good use for, for 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 many things because it is it is pretty stable and it is pretty sturdy and it is fairly light, uh, which is some of the things that also has to cover. Um, 
it's a lot there. Maybe we'll have to do another podcast on that in the future too, because I know it's a big topic. Um, Okay. Well, I want to close with three questions I ask everyone on the podcast. And then I want to hear a little bit more about the coming clean clean project, which is your podcast um, that I've listened to the first few episodes. And I'm just so excited about the information that you all are putting out there. And so um, I want to make sure people are aware of that. But for the for three questions, and Oliver, you may have answered this many years ago, but we'll see if, if you have any different. It may have changed. Today. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they've changed. Um, so the first one is: What are three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Oh, oh okay. I was, I was <laughs> like, give me time to think about yes, it. Yes. Okay. So I've got, I've got one that I would say, like when I, um. I was just thinking about it. One that I do that I think is kind of unique is like I'm 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 kind of like adopt a lot of these Buddhist philosophies, and mm. so I do a lot of paying it forward. And what I mean by that yeah. is it's one where it's like in terms of like random involvement in um you know I'm a I'm a CASA volunteer for Larimer County, so that's a court appointed um a children's advocate. Um, oh. It's also one where I'm part of this. Um, Longmont food rescue, where basically what happens if there's restaurants or grocery stores where food is going to, you know, basically meet its expiration date, you pick it up and then you go take it to um, other types of, whether it's uh, senior housing, low-income housing, um, other types of outlets like that. Um, It's just one where I, it's like, I've got this whole thing of like, um, kind of like focusing and channeling gratitude and Mm -hmm. just trying to do things to pay it forward. It's just one where it's like doing those types of things. It's just in general, I would say, from like a mind, body and spirit balance. It's one yes. where it's like, you do those things and it's, it feels good. It takes such a small amount of time. Um, but then it's like, I, I feel like you put that out into the world and then you get it in return. I love that. And I've been focusing a lot more on that myself too. And just realizing that, you know, it, if you can take, we all in our lives tend to be so focused on ourselves, like just our culture. And if we can just take some of that focus and energy and focus on serving or giving back to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's so rewarding. Like you said, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. um, And it can be something like so cool that you're doing it related to food, which is a topic that you're so passionate about anyway. So that's amazing. Now I don't want to go second check. (laughs) (laughs) But but I, I, I think yeah, it's, it's, it's really important. And, and I think from my perspective is it, it, it will sound a little bit more like uh, what I'm focusing on myself. Um, but also uh, we do need to focus on ourselves so that we they, can, they, right. Of course. Help of course. others and, through all the other work we're doing. Sorry. I didn't mean to take. No, and I, I, I really like it. So uh, it's, uh, put it's our own oxygen important. masks on first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Put that. That's a reason, right? That's a reason. Um, no, but I think like mine is is really like especially since this has been a journey of health for a fairly long time. That's been uh, focused on a lot of different things. It's it's actually becoming more the reflecting uh, on a daily basis on the things that you're putting into it. So I have my own kind of. 10, 12 definition of what is health for me. Uh, and I need to know every kind of night I am putting in my night journal, you know, what did I do uh, on, on that list? Mm-hmm. On that list, there's also appreciation and passing it forward, actually. Yes. But that's a further down list. But on the health side, I, I map out everything from uh, eating to fasting, from working out mm-hmm. to moving, uh, from breathing, meditation, uh, and, and general kind of like uh, appreciation and journaling, uh, tracking, uh, all the things you're doing. And then um, the different, I would say if, if I had to add one other, other piece here is like stacking it up on top of each other so I can mm-hmm. do as many things in, in as little time as possible with two small kids, you know, uh, business, you know, wife, you know, family, a lot of things going on. You know, I, I try to stack as many things on top of each other as I can. So uh, I'm meditating uh, at night while I'm reading uh, because it's something that I also need to spend more and getting, you know, infrared uh, light therapy at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I'm like trying to combine them as much as I can. So stacking them up to make them efficient Mm -hmm. uh, and then keeping track of it. Mm -hmm. Because then I know I haven't been doing a hard workout for a long time now. I need to put in something like Fran or something like that. I've been Mm -hmm. steering away from the short, super intense (laughs) workouts, but by looking at it on a piece of paper, it's just, Mm -hmm. you know, it's longevity. It's, it's for the long run. Yes. And like everything tracking and data is, is important to know that you're steering in the right direction. Cool. All right. Two other things. You can make them quicker, but I want top three things from each of you. <laughs> I, I felt like I gave two. So one was uh, tracking, okay. journaling okay. and tracking and the other one is stacking. Um, I got it. <laughs> 
the last one be just you know be present be happy mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh just because again everything becomes when you're in the the race just make sure you stop smell the roses and drink uh, uh, drink your coffee and enjoy it and spend time with your kids and so on just like make sure you enjoy those small things and i'll make my i'll make my other two quick the other thing i try to do is make sure i get enough sleep it's hard yes. But I try yeah. to make sure you get enough sleep. A sleep. You don't do a very good day. job, Jackie. I don't uh, sorry, do a very good job. I, I get text messages and emails from you at the most it's weird, weird times. Hours. It's totally yeah. true. But I'm a, I'm a big fan of naps. Um, uh -huh. The other thing I would say is hydration, especially for me. I'm here in Colorado, living at 5,500 feet. Um, so it's one where it's like just making sure to stay hydrated all the time is also important. Amazing. Um, what is one thing you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it, or something that you're working on? I'll go back to the whole thing with, with sleep. Yeah. yeah. It, it's one where it's, I mean, it's just a constant challenge. It's hard to turn your brain off at night, you know? And it's so like, hard. you try to do the whole like meditation and all of kind of things of like, you know, relaxation. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm kind of high strung all the time, including when I go to bed at night, but um, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a journey. It's hard. Yes. Sometimes mine the hardest is, thing to do is to do nothing. It, for sure. My, mine is, uh, and, and, you know, I always wanted this perfect morning routine where it's kind of mm -hmm. you wake up, I walk into the forest, you know, <laughs> put my cup yeah. of coffee, read a little my book, do Qigong or like weird stretching. And then the family <laughs> gets up. That That's not really how it happens in real the life. The kids uh, aren't on board with that. No, uh, and not <laughs> always. Not so uh, it happens fairly rarely. Um, yeah. But but I really love when, when, when that, yeah. you know, have a great start to the day with intention, basically. Yeah, I love that. All right. Last question is, what does a healthy life look like to you? I would say for me, it's, it, it comes back to balance. I always have to remind myself that it's like, I love my job, but I think I'm a better, a better executive director of clean able project when I'm a, a good, a good daughter and a good partner. And I'm a good partner when I'm a good, you know, <laughs> executive director of clean able project. So it's, it's all a matter of that, of that balance, but it's also mm -hmm. one where I'm a, I'm a huge fan of you actually never work a day in your life as long as you love your job. And so make sure that whatever it is that you're doing, that it is one of your, one of your passions so that it doesn't feel like work. Love it. How about you, Oliver? It's it's, it's something along the same lines, uh, uh, for sure. Um, you know, really like keeping track of the different things is something I do a lot. So I make sure that I actually, you know, do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, mm -hmm. that's that that's key. Mm -hmm. I love it. Awesome. Well, can you just speak just for just quickly on what the Coming Clean project is, why you started it and um, where people can listen to what you're putting out there? Oliver, you want to take that one? Yeah. So the, the Coming Clean project is basically to, again, get more attention and awareness uh, uh, on in, environmental toxins in general, how they mm -hmm. creep into our food chain and what you can do about it. So equally mm -hmm. as much as like kind of the solutions, talking with, uh, you know, uh, different trailblazers and mavericks out there who are like trying to find solutions to either go straight to the source and kind of eliminate lead exposure or the recycling of car batteries or whatever it is out there. Or, you know, some of the, the, the brands that are putting attention on clean products and, you know, just trying to make a difference. So that's, a, that's a, a key part. But also, because this is such a complicated matter, provides some kind of solutions for people. You know, mm -hmm. you know what to do, you know, how do I know? I feel like at, at every certain test, there's something like, now I can't eat this. Now I can't do that. So, right. you know, how do I stay sane in, in this right. uh, navigating? It? it can cause a lot more anxiety, even just the more, you know, but having some sense of control or some sense of there's something I could do about this, I think is really important. And I love the approach you all are taking. And I've listened to a couple of the episodes. You have some interesting ones about toxins in breast milk and about lead and um, I'm just, I'm excited to keep listening and, and hearing the experts that you have on in your conversations. And I really enjoyed our conversation today. I think it's really got my mind going and I think there's a lot I'm taking away from it. And I hope the listeners will be taking away something too. And we'll have to have you on again at some point in the future to talk more about one of these other topics because there's so much to discuss. So thank you guys both so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for your, uh, Julian. Uh, we've known you, I've known you for quite a long time and it's impressive. Uh, your journey <laughs> is impressive. You keep amazing us. Oh, well, thank you. I've appreciated your support along the way and loved seeing your journey and your growth. Um, just, you know, you personally and your family and then Fiori. So it's great to reconnect. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks.
Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people. 